Hey guys, just before we get into reading this electrical schematic diagram, I've actually produced a workbook which includes a copy of the schematics we're about to reverse engineer. If you wanted me to send you a copy which will help you follow along as I explain them in this video, there's a link in the description where I can email them to you. And just a heads up guys, you'll receive a few more emails from me over the next week with some information on a training academy for automation specialists that I'm currently working on. And the focus of this training academy will be helping people develop the skills and knowledge needed for them to progress into the automation and controls industry. But of course, if this is something you're not interested in, that's absolutely fine. Just make sure you unsubscribe after receiving the initial schematic workbook. So just a quick intro to the project these schematics are from. Firstly, this is a genuine school refurbishment project brought to us by an electrical contractor who's asked us to do the HVAC and BMS control upgrade. The original trend system was installed back in 2000, which is obviously pretty old and in need of an upgrade. We propose KNX or Loxon as a new control system. The nice thing about KNX and Loxon is these manufacturers make it much easier for people to buy their hardware and access their programming software, whereas trend rightly or wrongly, is a little bit more locked down. Now, as this site's about a five hour drive away from where we're based, it was far easier and more practical for us to reverse engineer these original schematics to get an understanding of the current system and how we can improve things before visiting site. And that's exactly what I'm gonna run through with you guys now, breaking it into manageable steps. So in this video, I'm mainly focusing on the controls to understand the logic behind how the system has been designed. And this tends to be where most people struggle to follow the schematics, which is completely understandable. But this part, nine times out of 10, is always the most critical in understanding the system. But before we do that, let's have a quick look at the schematic as a whole and try and build up a picture in our head of the project as a whole. So page one, we can see that it's a three phase supply. We've got a trend out station, which is the, ultimately the PLC. We've got some temperature sensors out in the field. And just, just to point out on every page, we've got this horizontal bold line, which is basically the divide between what's in the field and what's within the panel. So this side is obviously out in the field and this side is within the panel. So page two, we've got our trend outstation continued and we've got inputs on this page again, which are digital this time. So you can see we've got push buttons and we've got contacts. And then we've also got outside of the, in the field is a heating pump. DPS, which is a differential pressure switch. Page three, we've got our trend out station or PLC continued. And on this page, we've got output. So the first one to look at is these SRMVs. And what these are is they're trend relays, which take a naught to 10 volt signal and convert them into a digital relay output signal. So we can think of those as just relay digital outputs. And then the other ch two channels here, 39 and 37, they're giving out a zero to 10 volt DC signal to boiler one and boiler two. And if you're interested to learn why the boilers take a zero to 10 volt signal, there's more information within the workbook on page 14. So page four, this is where the 24 volt AC and 10 volt DC controls start. And this will be the focus of this video. So we're gonna come back to this in more detail, but we've also got a fire alarm signal. We've got a pressurization unit and we've got a gas valve signal. Page five is controls continued. We can also see that there's a pump there and there's a pump here, so two pumps and more details on the boiler control. And then on page six, we've got some more controls and we can see here there's two more pumps and controls for the water heaters within the school. So as a quick recap, the devices in the field the system is currently monitoring or controlling comprise of 10 temperature sensors, one pump differential pressure switch, can never say that right, two boilers, a fire alarm signal, one pressurization unit, a gas valve closed signal, 
four pumps and an on-off signal for the school water heaters. Now onto the fun bit, let's start reverse engineering the controls to understand the control philosophy and ultimately how the system has been designed. Just a quick one guys, if there's components within this schematic that you're not familiar with or that I haven't ex explained in much detail, if you visit the workbook, you'll see on the legend pages, it goes into more detail of what these components are. Right guys, let's get into the controls then. And the first place to look at is the transformer, transforming the voltage from 240 volt AC to 24 volt AC. And what you'll also see is that I've highlighted parts of the schematic into relevant group colors to help you understand what devices relate to each other within the schematic. So let's start with the green components and in a nutshell this little subsystem ultimately protects the 24 volt AC circuit and indicates if the control circuit is live or the fuse is tripped. So we've got our transformer here 24 volts on this side, zero volts on this side. And if everything's good with the fuse, this MCB here, it's actually a fuse, the voltage can travel down here across here and then two things happen at once. We get RA relay energized, that's the coil of the relay, and we also get the control circuit live lamp light up. And if we go back to the top here, as you can see, this is RA, we go back up here, this is also RA, and at the same time, we've got 24 volts over here going to this point here, and this is a normally closed contact. So when that MCB is good, it's closed, and energizes RA, which then, because this is normally closed, opens it, not lighting this control fuse fail. So quick explanation of the relays that we see in this schematic before we move any further. So like this relay here, RA1, what that's telling us is, we've got a box there, the name of it is RA, okay? And then one is telling us how many poles are associated with it. So straight away, we know that there's, in this case, one thing being controlled controlled when this energizes. And we can see that over here is a normally closed contact of RA. And it tells us this is pole one. Let's have a look at the yellow subsection now. And this indicates if the fire alarm is active and then it prevents the 24 volt AC control voltage getting to any other devices in the panel. So if we zoom into the relay, we can see three things happen off the back of this. So three poles on R1. So the first pole is R1-1 here. The second pole is R1-2 here. And then up on another page up here is R1-3. If we stick here for now, this is the signal into the PLC to tell us that the fire alarm is activated. So let's have a look at the yellow control subsystem for the fire alarm. So what we got is we've got 24 volts going down here, it's leaving the panel through these terminal blocks, and it says here, fire relay open on fire. So when there's a fire, we don't get anything back here, which means that this R1 does not energize. So doesn't energize, which means that it stays in its normal state. And if we have a look over here, we've also got 24 volts spurring off this point here, which goes here. And in its normally, normally closed state, when there is a fire, current or voltage passes through this normally closed contact and activates that fire alarm light. And at the same time, we'll also get a signal into our PLC. Now, when there's not a fire, continues to travel through here, back into the control panel, and it does energize R1. So what that means is, at the same time, the voltage over here, it goes here, and now this is open. So nothing will travel to this light here and it won't light up. And because this is normally open over here, this will now be closed, which will mean that voltage can travel along here and get to this point. Now let's have a look at the orange subsystem. So just in a nutshell, this subsystem indicates if the pressurization unit is in fault and it prevents 24 volt AC control voltage getting to any other devices within the panel. So just on the power side, which is pretty simple, we got single phase supply powering the pressurization unit, live and neutral. So on the control side, providing we've got 
no fire alarm, this will be closed, which allows voltage to flow down here, which allows us to pick up on this leg a 24 volt voltage going into the pressurization unit. Now this is most likely, number 20 is the common of an internal fault relay, and then it comes out on 22. So it will come back on 22, back into the panel, terminal seven and, and connect to the coil of this relay, R2. And we can see R2 has three poles, so three things will be happening when that relay energizes. So when the pressurization unit goes into fault. And just for clarity, this is the zero volt side over here. So you can see on this line here, everything is zero volts. So the first pole on that relay is this one, R2 slash one, which is normally open. So if there isn't a fault, the voltage will continue down the schematic. That's the first thing. The second thing is because this will be energized and this is normally closed, it will be open. So no voltage will flow to this fault light. And the third thing that happens on the third pole is a signal into our PLC to tell us that the pressurization unit is in fault. So the next bit, let's have a look at the red subsystem. And in a nutshell, this indicates if the gas valve is closed, simple as that. So providing there's no fire, we've got a voltage coming down here and then we're picking up over here, coming along here, down here, and then we're going out of the control panel to this gas valve and then back into the panel on this terminal block to firstly this relay, R3, and secondly, this light. So if the gas valve is closed, which will mean that there's no gas getting to the boilers, this will be closed, which will mean the voltage will be able to energize this relay, this is zero volts again, and also bring on this light on the front of the panel. But remember, we've also got this one pole of the relay, which is doing something. So let's have a look at that. And that's back up on page two. And again, that's a signal being fed into the PLC to let the PLC know that the gas valve is closed which we want it to be open. Right, onto the light blue subsystem. And in a nutshell, this is a push button on the front of the panel for an engineer or operator to press, which then bypasses the automatic control programmed in the PLC for X number of minutes. And this allows engineers to test or service systems, but also allows manual control if the electronics fail. So just looking at the relay to start with, relay MR, and we can see that it has eight poles, so eight things happen when this relay is energized. So firstly, let's have a look how that becomes energized. So if everything's good and the fire alarm's not on, we got voltage passing down here. And then if there's no fault with the pressurization unit, we get voltage then to the rest of the system, including this manual operator switch. So we got voltage there, and then we've also got voltage into this timer relay, T1. This is obviously the manual push switch. And then also to the contact within the timer relay. So the manual operation, someone would come along and press that button, which would then trigger this timer relay, which will close this contact here, allowing voltage to then energize MR with eight poles on it, and this is zero volts. So let's have a look at some of the things that happen once this relay is energized. So let's have a look at it in its normal state without that MR relay being energized. So no one has pressed that button. So what we've got is we've got our 24 volts coming across here, and then our digital output, this is a relay, but it's being used as a digital output by the PLC. Let's say it's closed. So the voltage continues through here in MR relays, normal state, and then it stops here at the auto off switch on the control panel door. So providing that's in auto, that's closed and allows the voltage con to continue down to this normally closed contact of this thermal overload. And that then energizes 
this contact and also brings on the run light and at the same time sends voltage out to this motor in the field and powers it. If we go back a step, if this thermal overload had tripped, that would mean the voltage would stop here because that would be open and it wouldn't energize C3 or this run light but at the same time because the normally open contact over here would now be closed we're picking up 24 volts here as well that would then allow that 24 volts to pass through the normally open contact which is now closed and bring on that trip light so if you remember what i said about this functionality allowing engineers or operators to put the system into service or test mode which overrides all the PLC electronics. So let's say that someone's pressed that button. So that button's been pressed and this MR relay is now energized. We got 24 volts again. And now it doesn't really matter if this is open or if it's closed because this MR relay is now energized, which means that that's no longer in that position. It's now in this position, which allows a constant flow of that 24 volts or a constant flow of current to bypass the PLC controls and then get to, again, the off or auto switch on the front of the panel. So now it's down to the user or operator engineer to then control this heating pump in the field just through that off or auto switch on the front of the panel. And then the same principles applies down here, what we talked about a second ago. And it's exactly the same principles across the drawing with that MR relay, the same thing happens. So you can see it on page five as well. You can see it on page three, and we're going to a bit more detail about page three in a bit. And also we've got a pole the eighth pole going into our PLC to tell us that yes, in fact, we are in service mode. So we've pretty much covered everything now on page four. We come back to the 10 volt DC power supply a bit later. So let's move on to page five now. So the next thing to look at is this little pink subsystem. And if you look closely, actually there's nothing happening in terms of the controls with this little subsystem. And if you look here, it said that there was initially some differential pressure switches designed in, but they were omitted, but there's still controls in place in the panel for future use if people wanted to add them in. So let's just have a look at how that operates anyway. So we've got our 24 volts coming down here, spurring off here, and then going out of the panel on terminal block 12. And this is where the differential pressure switch would be installed. And then it would go back on 11. But in this case, We've just got a little link cable, which is allowing the current to flow straight back and energize R4. R4 is constantly energized, providing there's 24 volts getting to this part of the schematic and then zero volts here. So that being energized then brings in this normally open contact. So you can see it's open at the moment, that would then close and it basically bridges that gap between the off auto switch on the panel and the coil of R7 relay. And this off auto switch is the control for the control of the boilers. Right, let's have a look at the purple subsystem. And this is exactly the same for boiler one and boiler two, it's very simple. And all this is, is a fault output from the boiler, which comes from the boiler into our panel and then if there is a fault this will energize and at the same time we'll light up this fault lamp and then we're going to zero volts down here and we're also using one pole of that relay and we're not using it for bringing that light on we're actually using it back at the plc to tell our plc that our boiler's in fault the next little subsystem is this dark blue one and it, again it's the same for both of the boilers and this is basically the run signal for the boiler so what happens is when the boiler's running we've got a signal coming from the boiler going to this relay energizing it and then it looks like the zero volts is at the boiler so if that's energized that would mean that this contact comes in so 24 volts goes through that normally open contact 
of relay six and passes down to this run light, which then goes to zero volts. So that's the first thing, but we've got two poles of that relay. First one's there. Second one, you probably guessed it, is a signal to our PLC to let us know that the boiler is running. Next thing is the gray subsystem, and this is really simple. So as I mentioned on the last bit, is we've got 24 volts coming down here. We're going through the off auto switch for the boiler control. So the switch on the door will be closed. As mentioned, relay R4 is permanently energized, which closes that contact, which powers up or energizes R7. And this is only one pole being used on this relay. So if we go back up, we can see that this pole is being used up here for the 10 volt DC control to the boilers. So at this point that would be closed. This allows from channel 39, a zero to 10 volt signal to then travel through MR and through this now closed relay seven and off to the boiler control. And then the zero volts is being picked up over here, there and along there. And whilst we're here, let's have a look at the MR relay again. So if you remember, this is the relay that's energized when an operator or engineer presses the service button on the front of the panel and that allows manual control of the system. It bypasses the automatic control programmed within the PLC. So let's pretend that that's been energized again. So no longer is that closed like that, it's now closed like this, which means that you've got no control coming from the PLC, stops there, and you've got control coming from this line over here, which we'll have a look at in a sec. And then that allows, if this is still engaged, allows the voltage to go through on one to the boiler and then back. Now if we look further over here, this is the 10 volt DC signal, which is being powered from this 24 volt step down transformer and ultimately going over here, powering up this 10 volt DC power supply and then out over here and we've also got the zero volts common with this transformer over here so that allows then a permanent 10 volt signal to pass to the controls of this boiler which basically puts the boilers on max and that's it guys i'll be releasing some more content similar to this in the future and if you're interested in becoming an automation specialist keep an eye out for those emails about the training academy and i'll see you on the next video